The next item of business is a statement by Hamza Youssef on Programme for Government 2023 to 2024. The First Minister's statement will be followed by a debate, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions during the statement. And I call on the First Minister up to 30 minutes, please. Presiding Officer, I have often talked about my paternal grandfather, Mohammed Youssef, over the last few months. I've commented on his journey from Pakistan to Paul Shields, where he first lived upon arrival to this country. What I haven't spoken about is the difficult circumstances that followed shortly after he arrived here in Scotland, in a country where he could barely speak the language and he had little to his name. Unfortunately, five years after arriving in Scotland, my grandmother, Muhammad Yusuf's wife, died at the age of 33, leaving my grandfather having to raise five children. He got remarried, but was left with five devastated ch children, including my father uh, and my uncle, one of his children, still a young baby. My grandfather went on to become a successful small business owner. And although he has now passed away, his wife, my, my step-grand, still to this day works in the convenience store uh, in Mayfield. She tell me, tells me Daniel Johnson is one to pop in on occasion. I mention his story, presiding officer, because there's no way that my grandfather, all those decades ago, could have supported his five children and have been a successful small business owner if it wasn't for the support of society and of the state. At a time when he really needed it, the government was there to support him financially. That, in turn, helped to unleash his entrepreneurial spirit. And over the decades, he created jobs and contributed significantly to society, not least through the taxes that he paid. There's no doubt in my mind that economic growth goes hand in hand with tackling poverty as it did for my grandfather all those years ago. Mm -hmm. The programme for government I'm publishing today is unashamedly anti-poverty and pro-growth. And it has a focus on supporting women who are disproportionately affected by the pressures of modern life, including uh, through expanding our childcare offer. Presiding officer, when I became First Minister, I promised I would lead a government for the whole country. In this chamber, we must never forget that while we disagree sometimes, and quite rightly passionately, there is far more that unites us than divides us. Over the last two years, the SNP and Scottish Green parties have successfully worked together to build a greener, fairer Scotland. In a world full of uncertainty, people rightly expect their elected representatives to work together constructively. And that is exactly what we have done. So to all the parties represented in this chamber, I repeat the offer I made upon becoming First Minister. You will sometimes disagree with things we do, but when you can work with us, you will find that my door is always open. I've already shown my willingness to work with others in recent months. But we should also remember the words of the late David McCletchie. He warned about worshipping the false god of consensus. In that vein, the government I lead will not simply coalesce around the lowest common denominator. For the good of society, for our future, for our children, where we need to, we will pick a side. And in particular, while other political parties are abdicating their responsibilities to tackle the climate emergency, we will be unapologetic in taking the action needed to ensure a sustainable future for our children and for our planet. Presiding officer, this programme is an opportunity to be explicit about the driving mission of this government. So let me make it abundantly clear. We are a government who will maximise every single lever at our disposal to tackle the scourge of poverty in our country. We have adopted progressive tax and spending policies to face those challenges. I will never shy away from the belief that those who earn the most should pay the most. But let me be equally clear, without any equivocation, we also need to support economic growth. Not for its own sake, but so we can tackle poverty and improve our public services. The unfortunate reality is the Scottish Government is currently operating with one hand tied behind our back. Scotland has had no control 
over the fallout from the UK government's disastrous mini-budget, or Brexit, or over a decade of austerity. However, we still have to deal with the devastating consequences of those actions. To give just one example, in the past five years, we have spent more than £700 million pounds in countering the impact of Westminster welfare cuts alone. That's why this government will never stop believing that decisions about Scotland should not be made by a government based in Westminster, but by the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just remind members there should be no interventions or interruptions of any kind during the statement? Independent countries comparable to Scotland are wealthier and fairer than the UK. And with our abundant resources, the question we must ask ourselves is why not Scotland? In proposing the case for independence, we will set out a positive vision for Scotland's future. And there is much to be positive about. Scotland's economy already performs better than most parts of the UK. We have world-class universities and colleges and significant strengths and potential in many of the key economic sectors of the future. Today's programme sets out how we will build on these strengths to make people's lives better. Presiding officer, tackling poverty is deeply personal to me. Growing up in the Islamic faith, one of the core beliefs of our faith and that I was taught is that you're not a true Muslim if you have a full stomach while your neighbour goes to bed hungry. Tackling poverty isn't straightforward, given the restrictions of devolution, especially in the face of a cost of living crisis and challenging budget settlements. But it is absolutely essential. So whether it's faith or your humanism and ingrained sense of social justice, we must all surely unite in saying that in 2023, with the abundance of wealth we have as a society, it is morally indefensible that people in our country, frankly, our planet, go to sleep hungry. So my first announcement today is this, that by February, we will remove income thresholds for our Best Start Foods programme, meaning a further 20,000 pregnant mothers and children will benefit from financial support for milk and healthy food. This is a further demonstration of this government giving our children the best possible start. And we will invest more than £400 million in the Scottish Child Payment to help more than 300,000 children across the country. For many families, the payment worth £25 per child per week ensures food is on the table or the heating is on at home. We can already see the benefits of this policy now but its true legacy will last for a lifetime. Through our actions, through this government's actions, an estimated 90,000 children have been lifted, are estimated to be lifted out of poverty. That is the difference this government is making. The Scottish Child Payment is part of a total investment of more than five billion pounds in Scottish government social security payments which supports more than 1.2 million people the length and breadth of Scotland. I can confirm that funding will increase by almost £1 billion in the year ahead, and we will continue to explore what more can be done to tackle poverty during the budget process. We've also convened an expert group to look at how we can make progress towards a minimum income guarantee, and today I'm calling on the UK government to use their reserve powers to establish an essentials guarantee, to ensure the value of universal credit payments is always sufficient for people to afford essential items such as food, transport and energy. In addition to these actions, we will continue to reduce some of the costs that affect households right across the country. Presiding officer, this government has led the way in the provision of universal free school meals for primary school children. I can confirm that working with councils, we will roll out universal free school meals for all pupils in primary six and seven, starting with those children in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment. From October, we're introducing a pilot project to remove peak fares on ScotRail services. In addition, we recognise housing costs are a key factor in determining people's standard of living. During the cost of living crisis, this government took prompt action 
to introduce emergency rent caps for most private tenants and to introduce additional protections against eviction. We have now laid regulations to ensure, th to ensure those measures will remain in place until the 31st of March next year. We will also introduce a housing bill to introduce long-term rent controls and new tenants' rights and to establish new duties for the prevention of homelessness. And we will continue to work to reduce the number of people living in temporary accommodation. We will invest £750 million to support the delivery of affordable homes and meet our target of securing 110,000 affordable homes by 2032. 10% of those homes will be located in rural and island communities because we know those communities are facing significant housing challenges. But we also know those communities are not passive. We see in the lights of the Arran Development Trust, the Mull and Iona Community Trust and Staff and Community Trust, real ambition in supporting new housing. So we've been working with local government, business, the third sector, and crucially local communities to publish an action plan for housing in rural and island areas later this year. We've established a 20, 25 million pound fund to provide homes for key workers in rural areas. Across Scotland, we will invest 60 million pounds this year to acquire empty properties for use as affordable homes. Following consultation, I can confirm we will also enable councils to apply a premium on council tax rates for second homes, a demonstration of our desire to empower local government to tackle the challenges they face. And we will introduce a cladding remediation bill and ask this parliament be given the powers to introduce a levy in Scotland mirroring the UK government's building safety levy for England. Presenting officer, the protection of and where possible the advancement of rights is a collective obligation for each and every single one of us. I've spoken about the racism and Islamophobia that I have and continue to face. Many others in this parliament have spoken about the bigotry, the homophobia, the ableism, the misogyny that they have been on the receiving end of. And as part of our mission to promote equality and eradicate hatred, we will improve human rights protections through a human rights bill. There are those in this parliament who have said recently, we concentrate far too much on social policy. But, presiding officer, it is our job, every MSP's job, to help protect marginalised communities from the hatred that is far too pervasive in our society. And a population that has its rights protected is one that can thri thrive. It's not just good for society, that it is, but it's also good for our economy too. Finally, on the theme of equality, we recognise, recognise that helping people into good, fairly paid work is also a key part of tackling poverty. We will work with local authorities and employers to help people who face barriers to, to starting or restarting work. And we will support care leavers into employment. This is just one of the ways in which we will help to keep our promise to those with experience of care. I will also, also personally convene a dedicated cabinet subcommittee for the promise. We will not let those with care experience down. Presiding officer, this government also recognises the crucial role of childcare in helping parents to return to work, benefiting not just them, but the wider economy. The Scottish Government has expanded ELC to 1140 hours a year for all three and four year olds, and around a quarter of all two year olds. I am pleased to announce we will go further. Firstly, we will provide funding in six early adopter council areas to increase access to childcare from nine months old through to the end of primary school. Secondly, we will accelerate the next phase in our expansion of childcare for families with two year olds at reaching thousands more families. Thirdly, we will give parents and carers more scope to manage their childcare so it meets their specific needs. Some parents may want to use a mix of provision and may find arranging and keeping track of their childcare stressful. So we'll simplify that process, enabling parents through digital means to have more control over their childcare choices. Fourth, we will support efforts to recruit and retain more childminders with an aim to recruit a thousand more childminders by the end of this parliament. And fifth, 
we know one of the biggest challenges the sector faces is recruitment. So I can confirm today we will provide funding so staff in the private, voluntary and independent sector who deliver funded early learning and childcare are paid a minimum of £12 an hour from April of next year. High quality, early education and childcare is a perfect example of a policy that is both anti-poverty and pro-growth. And I'm proud that Scotland has the most generous childcare offer in the UK and I'm committed to ensuring we stay ahead and provide families with the crucial support that they need. Presiding officer, one of my earliest actions as First Minister was to develop a new and stronger relationship with business so we can work together to create jobs and create opportunities. In the year ahead, we will implement the recommendations made by the New Deal for Business Group. Where we can, we will also work with the UK Government to support growth. In fact, I wrote to the UK Government just yesterday to request discussions on this very issue. One idea I'm keen to explore with them is a recommendation in the recent report from the Hunter Foundation about using tax incentives and wider economic policy to support investment in key sectors such as renewables. Scotland has long been a nation of innovation and invention, but for all the excellent success that we have had, we also have to be honest, we haven't always managed to retain that entrepreneurial talent and the jobs that they, that they create here in Scotland. So this programme for government sets out a £15 million plan to support innovation and entrepreneurship. It includes increased support for Scottish EDGE and the, Scot the Scottish Ecosystem Fund, continued work to implement Mark Logan's excellent review of our technology ecosystems, a blueprint to make our colleges and universities stronger bases for entrepreneurs, and a programme to deliver the recommendations of Anna Stewart's equally excellent report on supporting women into enterprise. We will also work to continue to attract international investment and promote exports, and we will support small businesses. For example, we will work with local government and our enterprise agencies to transform the support we provide them. We'll work with business organisations to help small businesses improve their productivity, and we will build on the work of the New Deal for Business Group, for example, in considering improvements to the non-domestic rates system. These early actions demonstrate our determination to listen and to act as we build a new relationship with business to support economic growth for a purpose. In the year ahead, we'll continue investment in important infrastructure, including, of course, to continued investment in the construction of six new ferries by 2026. And alongside our record investment in active travel, we'll reopen the Leavenmouth rail line, electrify the Glasgow to Bar headline, and open a new rail station at East Linton. We are, of course, committed to improving the A96, including dueling the road from Inverness to Nairn with a Nairn bypass. And let me be crystal clear, uh, presiding officer, this government, my government, will duel the A9 from Inverness to Perth. And I can confirm today Thank we you. have launched the procurement for the Tomatin to Moy section as the next step in that work. Presiding officer, we are also helping the rural economy. In the coming year, we will help to create a new framework for rural support through the Agriculture Bill. We'll promote our food and drink industry. We'll press the UK government to honour its obligations to our fishing sector. When it comes to Scotland's land, it is clear that too much of our land is in the hands of too few. Our land reform bill will make land ownership more transparent and will also give communities more opportunities to own their land. We will step up to the challenge, we'll seek to be bold and radical, and we'll continue to develop proposals for crofting law reform. And we'll continue to support Scotland's thriving tourism sector and to promote major events. And we will publish further details of our future support for culture in the forthcoming budget. This sector should be assured that this government values the role of culture, not just for the substantial economic impact it has, but also for the incredible joy that it brings people in Scotland and right around the world. The final part of our economic plans I want to talk about is also one of the most important. You only, presenting officer, need to look at the United States or the European Union to see the way in which ambitious government and state support for green industries 
is helping to create new jobs. The inactivity of the UK government risks us falling behind in an increasingly competitive race. So the Scottish Government is taking action to boost green industries with the limited powers that we do have. One important area where I can announce change is through the consenting processes for renewable technologies. We will agree a sector deal with the onshore wind industry to half the consenting time for new Section 36 wind farms. And as part of this deal, we will maximise the benefits onshore wind can create for local communities and for Scotland's economy. We'll also streamline offshore wind consenting processes and continue to implement our hydrogen action plan. But I continue to appeal to the UK government, which holds these substantial levers of our tax and financial incentives to use these powers to unleash and accelerate the renewables potential of our country. Our economy, indeed our planet, deserves better than Westminster inertia. We will also take forward our work on a green industrial strategy. We'll consult on, heat in buildings, uh, on a heat in buildings bill and we'll continue to promote a circular economy. We'll publish our final energy strategy and just transition plan and we'll continue to protect and enhance our natural environment. And crucially, we'll continue to show global leadership in inter international climate discussions. Presiding officer, as well as the enormous economic opportunity created by climate action, there's an overwhelming moral imperative. The terrifying impacts of climate change are not something to worry about in the distant future. They are here today. In that context, some of the actions of the Westminster parties over the summer, such as the UK government's reluctance to support onshore wind, its commitment to more than 100 new oil and gas licenses, Labour's U-turning, on low emission zones, they are baffling as they are dangerous. Yeah, the Scottish Government will take a responsible approach and show climate leadership. Tackling the climate crisis will be hard, but in the long run, doing nothing, or even worse, acting far too slowly, is the more expensive choice. It's a choice that will see far more lives lost on our planet. It's a choice for which we would rightly never be forgiven by our children yeah or our grandchildren. Presiding officer, this programme also sets out how we will support strong and high quality public services. The National Health Service is already making progress in recovering from the pandemic. We have the best performing accident and emergency departments in the UK, and in the last year, the number of people waiting more than 18 months for treatment has almost halved. We'll work with health boards to reduce waiting lists further in the year ahead. A fourth national treatment centre will open in Forth Valley in the coming year and the centre at the Golden, Golden Jubilee Hospital will increase our capacity. And we will continue to work with local authorities on the introduction of the National Care Service. Presenting officer, during the summer I spent a considerable amount of time hearing directly from people from all walks of life right across the country about the challenges they are struggling with. One group who are inspirational is the Purple Poncho Players, a theatrical group made up of disabled people who put on gripping performances which challenge governments and all of us in society to confront the uncomfortable truth of life as a disabled person in Scotland. I heard very moving testimony from them, the Glasgow Disability Alliance and others who have been affected by the closure of the Independent Living Fund, which assists disabled people with especially complex needs to get the support they need in order to live independent lives. I'm therefore pleased to announce today that I will, I will reopen the Independent Living Fund in the next financial year with an initial investment of up to £9 million. In the year ahead, we will also improve access to GP services and we will launch the National Centre for Remote and Rural Health and Care. We'll also publish a new delivery plan for mental health and wellbeing. We'll continue with our mission to reduce drugs deaths and we'll invest in alcohol and drugs partnerships. Recent drugs death figures show we're heading in the right direction, but no more than that. The scale of the challenge in front of us requi requires us to take, to take radical approaches. There must, th these approaches must be grounded in the evidence of what works. And that is why we will support a proposal to establish a safer drug consumption facility 
and argue for drug law reform. In light of the latest Home Office Select Committee report, I would urge the UK Government to listen to the evidence and either support a safer drug consumption facility or at least devolve the power to us so we can more easily take that bold action that is required. We're also reviewing the responses to the alcohol marketing consultation. We will always support jobs and the economy. We'll also work with industry where appropriate, but be in no doubt, we will take further action to reduce alcohol harm and particularly to protect children from its ill effects. Talking of children, presiding officer, I hear too often about how common vaping is amongst our young people. In the next year, we will take action to reduce vaping and particularly amongst children. I'm pleased to announce this government will also consult on curbing the sale of disposable single-use vapes, including consulting on an outright ban. Presiding officer, this government also recognises the vital importance of supporting our health and care workforce. Scotland is and remains the only part of the UK where there has been no industrial action in the health service. That's because we never question the motivations of our workforce in seeking higher pay in the midst of a cost of living crisis. And we were prepared to face up to some very challenging negotiations. We worked with unions. We agreed deals which benefit patients and staff. And as a result, we've ensured NHS Scotland staff remain the best paid anywhere in the UK. And I'm pleased to confirm that today I will fulfill a promise I made to social care staff before becoming First Minister. We will provide funding to enable an increase of pay of social care workers in direct care roles so that they can be paid at least £12 an hour. For those on full-time contracts, this could lead to a pay increase from April of up to £2,000 a year. This increase of over 10% values our social care staff, helps them to support their families and also helps us to recruit and to retain staff. It is good for individual employees, for our social care services and for our society as a whole. Presiding officer, another issue that is close to my heart as First Minister and as a husband and as a father is the issue of miscarriage. I've spoken before about the personal loss and trauma that my wife Nadia and I have faced through multiple miscarriages. It's a health issue that society is now more open about but I think is still less talked about than perhaps maybe it should be. I know how that sense of loss, regardless of when it happens during a pregnancy, is certainly one that stays with you for life. Each loss Nadia and I have suffered has been difficult. There's no doubt in my mind that we can better support those who experience miscarriage. The programme for government today outlines how we will continue to improve care and support for miscarriage including ensuring women don't have to wait until a third miscarriage to receive tailored support. Uh, the, we also will help to provide access to progesterone prescriptions and secure separate spaces in hospital, hospitals within maternity wards for women who suffer a miscarriage. I'm also pleased to say that later this month, we will launch a certificate memorial book of pregnancy and baby loss prior to 24 weeks. And I want to thank and pay tribute to my predecessor for the work that she has done on that particular issue. Presiding officer, this government will also continue to support our schools and promote excellence in education. We'll introduce an education bill to establish a new qualifications body in Scotland and to create an independent education inspectorate. We'll set out plans for reforming our education and skills bodies and we'll deliver the pay deal we've reached with our teachers. We'll continue our work to widen access to university this work is now seeing record numbers of students from disadvantaged backgrounds, around 5,600 in the latest official statistics, enter our universities. We'll also rejoin key international education studies and we'll continue to focus on closing the attainment gap and improve outcomes for young people with additional support needs. We'll also continue to support equality and diversity in schools, for example, through our anti-racism and education programme and, prim uh, and through promoting a decolonised curriculum. And we'll invest in our police, fire and just, uh, justice services too. The introduction of body-worn cameras is a priority for the police and for this government. So we'll start introducing that technology next year. And we've already reduced the backlog of cases in our justice system by over a third. And we'll aim to end the backlog in summary cases during 2024. And we'll, we will invest in our prisons, 
while also working with community justice partners to reduce reoffending and create safer communities. We will focus, continue to focus on ensuring victims and witnesses of crime are at the very heart of our justice system. Presiding officer, we live in times when the rights of women in many parts of the world are regressing. It is important that governments who believe passionately in taking a stand against misogyny, including state and institutional misogyny, stand up and be counted. That is why we will work with Gillian Mackay to support her bill for safe access for abortion. It simply cannot be right that women feel in any way impeded in accessing health care. And we will bring forward legislation to criminalise misogynistic abuse, following the, pub the public consultation and Baroness Kennedy's report into the issue. Presenting officer, just before uh, I close, I want to expand on that point. The Me Too movement, the claim the night marches, and the response to the murders of Sarah Everard and Sabina Nessa have instigated a movement of women sharing their stories about everyday sexism, about harassment, about the tragic and violent crime women <coughs> are too often subjected to. The steps the Scottish Government is taking to criminalise misogynistic abuse and improve, in our, uh, improve our criminal justice system, they're, they're in part a response to that, but they cannot be the only response. There's a much bigger responsibility on our society as a whole, and particularly on all men, to create a positive change. Men, all of us, myself of course included, need to do more than simply call out negative male behaviour. We need to tackle what is often called toxic masculinity, which harms men and boys, as well as, of course, women and girls. We must build a society where men feel confident in taking a stand against misogyny. But to do so, we must also promote the positive and highlight to boys and men the benefits that positive masculinity can provide for their everyday lives, how it can build respectful, healthier relationships with their partners, with their families, with colleagues, with society, and also lead to better mental health and well-being for men and boys. The Scottish Government doesn't have all the answers on this. I, I, we cannot take, cannot take it on alone. But it is a challenge we will return to, and as First Minister, I'm committed to leading on this issue in my own actions and those of the, gov of the government that I lead. Presiding officer, in conclusion, at the start of this statement, I made it clear the Scottish Government will always be on the side of the people we serve. Scotland is, certainly should be, a land of opportunity. But I know it doesn't always feel like that. To people bearing the brunt of a Westminster cost of living crisis, to families living in poverty, to struggling businesses, to those who still face consequences of discrimination and inequality. I get that. That's why this programme for government tackles poverty and inequality head on. As part of our work to create opportunities and build strong communities. In the year ahead, we will help more than 300,000 children with more than £1,000 a year through the Scottish Child Payment. We'll increase social security spending by almost a billion pounds. We'll expand free school meals. We'll widen access to financial advice. We'll help more parents buy healthy food. We'll help disabled people with the most complex needs so they can live independent lives. We'll safeguard the rights of tenants. We'll promote payment of the living wage. We'll increase the pay of childcare and social care staff. And we will expand high quality childcare. We will do all of this first and foremost because it is the right thing to do. But also, as I know from my own family history, because providing people with support and security helps them to contribute to society and create opportunities for others. This programme for government sets out how we will work with partners to tackle, to tackle poverty, to promote growth, to strengthen the public services we all depend on. The people in Scotland, people of Scotland, should be left in absolutely no doubt whatsoever. This Scottish Government is on their side. This programme for government shows how we will make progress towards a fairer, wealthier and greener Scotland. And I am delighted, Presiding Officer, to commend it to this Parliament. Thank you. That concludes the First Minister's statement.